what do you want to do? <laughs> I always ask people that, and nobody seems to know. So this is uh, well, this is a workshop. What it means we don't know what it is. <laughs> Uh, we'll sing and then uh, we can talk, okay? Yes. We can ask questions and Prasad will answer them all. <laughs> you know, people ask me all the time how I learned to chant. You don't learn to chant, you just open your mouth and make noise. <clears throat> And I used to uh, sing with uh, the Kirtan Lalas who were at the temple, the Bengali Vaishnavas who were at the temple all the time. They sang Hare Krishna from early in the morning to late at night. And uh, there was one group of guys that I really liked. There were three of them. The, the leader played harmonium, and <clears throat> he looked like a truck driver. <laughs> Tough. He didn't like me. He never looked at me, he never talked to me. He had wanted nothing to do with me. But the other two guys were really nice. And there was the drummer sat over there, and then the sumo player was sat over here. So the leader would start, he would sing a line, then the drummer would answer, and this guy would answer, and they'd keep going around and around. So I started off on the other side of the room, you know, and I would just sing along. After a couple of weeks, they got to know me, so they invited me to come sing, sit with them in the circle. So I sat next to the, uh, <laughs> and I, he gave, they gave me these big symbols, right? And they said, okay, now you play. I said, what do I play? So he took my hand, he went, <laughs> and then he took his hand out, and he went, <laughs> put his hand back, <laughs> after a month or two, I got it. Kind of the, advanced, the advanced training. So, so I would try my best to sing along with them and kind of I listen really carefully to this guy, right, the cymbal player, because he seemed to, he knew everything. So I and I just kind of copy him, you know, as he sang. Ah, okay, you got it. You know. So you now when I wake up in the morning. Uh, my voice is about you. <laughs> and over the course of the day, it kind of comes on up where human beings can actually hear it. <laughs> These guys wake up in the morning and they're like, So the leader, he starts this new melody, and it was so complicated. I had never heard anything like that in my life. It's like, no! That's just the first word. And on and And so, then the drummer sang, and then it was the two of us, right? So. I really listen closely, I go, ah, ah, and around a few times, a few times. I had my eyes closed, because I was really concentrating. And I didn't know that my buddy here went out to Pesha. <laughs> so he came around to us and I go, honey! <laughs> and he's not there, right? And I don't know what to say. <laughs> So I just made up my own line, you know? <laughs> the only time that that truck driver ever looked at me <laughs> was right after that. And he looked over and he goes, Buddy, uh. <laughs> you know, if he hadn't said Buddy, uh, I would not be here today. <laughs> You know, this was before I even was sang with these guys. One uh, the first, when the first uh, let's see, rainy season that I was here was the summer of 1970. 
You remember that, don't you? Most of you in your past lives. <laughs> So we used to, we, our job in life, it seemed, was to stare at my guru. That was, you know, that's what we did. <laughs> that's all we wanted to do, you know. But he wasn't so, you know, he didn't give us a lot to stare at. He would run away, go in his room. And... So these uh, kirtan walls had been there for months. And it was towards the end of the season. And one of these guys kind of tried to seduce one of the Western women that was in our group, right? This is obviously a no-no. So Maharaji found out about it. And in about two seconds, all 20 of these guys, with all their bags and everything, were loaded on the back of a truck, driven down to the train, sent home to Vrindavan. Right? So one of the Indian people says, Baba, you've just kicked out the, the Kirtan Rolls. Who would sing now? <laughs> but you understand, we didn't know, we didn't, we didn't know what to do. So there we were. There was a, a harmonium or a, something and a little drum, and we had to sing. Mahamantra. We had one instruction: sing. There was never how long. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean sing? When do we stop? He wasn't interested in sing. So, and the thing was, we were in this little temp little room around the corner. We couldn't even see him when he came out, if it was if it was our time to sing. He would come out and be having a great time with everybody else, you know? And we'd be sitting there. Oh. <laughs> and there was this microphone hanging from the ceiling that had been there since World War I. <laughs> So our beautiful kirtan was being broadcast to the whole valley, you know. You can see the, the ladies out in the field picking potatoes going on. <laughs> so there I was, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, you know. And I could fool myself for maybe an hour that I was really enjoying it, you know. But then, you know, the mind starts to kind of panic. You're actually asking yourself to pay attention to something. This is no, no way, right? So you start like, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, you know, I start. So I thought, okay, let me see. What, what I, when I was two, you know, yeah, I was taught, I was walking, crap. What was I doing? Yeah, I was walking around in the living room. Oh, yeah, I fell. My mom would pick me up. And then what did I do? I started reliving my life all the time, singing. Right? Hare Krishna had to go on, but my mind didn't have to pay attention. So I just started really, I went through it a few times, you know, and, and then I would be, I remember my girlfriend back in America. <laughs> and then after a while, you know, like a half an hour of that, I realized she broke up with me. <laughs> After a few days of like eight, ten hours a day, something actually happened. No one was more surprised than me. <laughs> Who knew something was supposed to happen? I just thought it would be torture forever. <laughs> but actually what happened was I started to you could like sit more deeply in the mantra. I just kind of, something, my mind just kind of said, ah, oh, shit, I'm here, but might as well pay attention. So I just kind of, like, and then the thoughts would come, and they would just go through, and they wouldn't grab me so much. And I was, I hate to say it, I was experiencing a little peace of mind. A little peace of mind was completely new to me. And it happened because we were asked to sing, we were told to sing, we were ordered to sing, and we, we had to sing for so many hours that we actually overcame some of the, the, the obstacles to, to chant. And I began to experience a little bit about what this is about, just a little bit, because 
There's no bottom to this. You can go as deep and deeper and deeper into the name. There's no end to it. But you have to get over the initial bumps in the road. There's no, that's it. You got it. You don't, you don't. But if you want to know what this is, you have to do a little practice. You have to pay some attention. And what we're doing is we're training ourselves to let go. What is it that tortures us? Our thoughts and our emotions, right? All day long, all we do is think about ourselves, right? We wake up in the morning, we start writing, producing, directing, and acting in the movie of me. <laughs> Where am I going? What am I going to do? This? I like this. Well, I mean, what am I? Why wear this? I go there. I'll do this. I'll do that. All we do is think all day long. React, think, react, think all day long. And we never get a break from it. So when you start doing some practice, you begin to see what that's like. Most of the time, we're not even aware that that's what's happening. But that's going on all the time. And that's where we are. That's where we, we really give ourselves a hard time. So when we do these practices, when we look at it from this point of view, we are training ourselves to be able to let go of the very things that give us real suffering, which is our thoughts. You know, the same thing can happen to two people, and they have a completely different way of living with it, right? And this is where we have to develop the ability to keep our our hearts in the right place and keep our hearts open no matter what happens. That's because real happiness, real love lives within us as who we are. It's not something we get from the outside. And when we're up, these practices uncover that inside of us. And then, whether there's an inside or an outside, that's for philosophers to worry about. But we could easily say that that love lives within us as our own true nature. The nature of the soul is love. And that's what these names are, the names of that place within us, each one of us. So. singing, you know, we weren't supposed to go see Maharaji. But every once in a while you have to go to the bathroom, so I walk out and I would be walking across the courtyard looking at the door to the back of the temple, but moving this way <laughs> to where he was sitting, right? And he was ah, down. So I would go, and then on the way back I tried the same thing this way. Ah, down. So, if he had not forced me to do that, I wouldn't be here, and you wouldn't be here. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. You think about that? I mean, I don't really know what you're doing here, but <laughs> I know what I'm supposed to be doing here. <laughs> he said all the time, he said, Ram Nam Karnese Sapura Hojata. Ram Nam Karnese Sapura Hojata. He said it over and over. And you know, we heard it a thousand million times. But I still don't know what he's talking about. So, you have to do something. We're just floating down the street, heading to the rapids. If we don't get to the shore, we're going to go over those rapids. We have to find out who we are, what we're doing. But it's not up here. It's not up here. Spiritual practice doesn't work in your head, in your intellect. It works with the very deep reactiveness that we have from our, how we've been programmed by life and the experiences we've had. It un uncovers a deeper place within us and it teaches, it trains us to, uh, to be able to let go of the stuff that causes us suffering. And it teaches us where real happiness lies. One time I was very much in love with somebody. And, uh, I was telling my, my Indian father, Mr. Tiwari, who 
I basically forced them to adopt me. <laughs> After Maharaji left his body, I used to arrive at their, uh, their house with all my luggage and just move in. And uh, so I was saying, and he looked at me and said, my boy. He used to, this guy knew everything, you know. He was amazing. He was a yogi. He was a headmaster of a big school. But he was, and he was a devotee of Maharaji's for 40 years. And uh, he was just incredible. So he would explain things to me. And the first words out of my mouth, he could see I hadn't understood a word he said. You know, and he said, my boy, is there something wrong with your brain? <laughs> So anyway, I was talking to him, and he said, I was telling him how much I loved this woman, blah, blah, and I said, ah, I said, he said, good, 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 okay, okay, okay. So he said, my boy, he said, relationships are a business. Do your business, enjoy. He said, but love, love lasts 24 hours a day, every day. Love isn't something we get from the outside. You don't fall in it, you don't fall out of it. It's, it's our true being. And we have to connect with that. The more, the more we, we look for that, the more we can connect with that. And that's what these practices are about. That's what chanting is about. It's not about joining any club or being one particular kind of person. It's about finding out what's in here. And you get the strength to be a good human being from doing these practices. A human being that cares about other human beings. That doesn't avoid uh, life and living, lives fully. But it's hard to do that in a good way in this world when everybody's grabbing and, and everything. So. So, okay, well, let's open the floor to any questions, comments, and Prasad is ready to answer. <laughs> we have a microphone, because I'm deaf. I'm a deaf kirtan mala. And if you have something you want to say, raise your hand. Let's buy your presence. Uh, could you please throw some light on free will, destiny, and the choices that a human life has? Nah. <laughs> Listen, all that stuff is... Does that help you when you get up in the morning and find a good way to go through the day? Anyway. You know, the way I feel about it is, if you feel you have choices to make, make them. You can't up-level things in your head and try to live that way. There's things we want in life, there's things we need, and we need to go out there and get those things. Whether it's our destiny to have them or not, well, we'll find out, right? Krishna says in the Gita, do what you do, but you offer the fruits of your actions to me, to him. You give it your best shot, but what happens is not up, it's not in our hands. Ramana Maharshi said that everything that's going to happen to us is written when we're born. The only freedom we have, he says, is how we live in each moment as it arises. Right? Well, how do we live in each moment? We don't even notice it coming and going. We're lost in all kinds of nonsense. Can I curse in here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Soon I'll forget on where I am anyway, and it's at the end of that. So, so you know, the thing is that, uh, yeah. You wanna you wanna speak some more? Take the mic back and talk to me. Um, I I I think uh, I I found the answer. Uh, it's just that. Um, that was quick. When, 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 when you, when you, no, when you say it, it's just, you know, it, it kind of resonates always, and so it's nice. Yeah. So, but the thing is, don't just, just don't, 
sit with it. Because if you really sit with what you think is the answer, then it'll start to change the way you act. It's not just enough to think, oh, that's what it is, and then go beat somebody up, or, you know what I mean? Or kick the dog, or whatever it is. All these practices, have, they have to change the way we live. They have to change the way we go through our days. They have to change the way we treat ourselves and the way we treat other people. Right? Whether it's free will or not free will, who knows? But it's what we do know is, are we treating ourselves well and are we doing well for others? Are we taking care of what has to be taken care of in our life? You know? it's, not, it's not so easy just to, to understand it here, but it has to change you here, and that takes time and practice. Thank you very much. Hi. I have been listening to you every day. My morning begins only listening to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I really do. I mean, it's hard. It, I had to learn how to say, you're welcome. And it's not an easy thing to say. You Thank know? you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I, I want to make it very clear. I sing for one reason and one reason only. Okay? That is to save my miserable ass. <laughs> you got it? Yes. That is why I sing. When I sit down, I don't know who you are, I don't know who I am. All I know is I'm singing, and I give everything I can to the practice. And if I was sitting here trying to get those kind of responses, they wouldn't come, right? This is my practice, this is what I do. And if you weren't here, I'd just be back in New York watching TV. This is wonderful. You came, I came, we're here, this is great. We help each other. This is the way this practice is done, right? So, I'm so grateful that you get something from it, really. But I also do. You give that to me, we give it to each other. It happens. So. Yeah. Apu? <laughs> thank you so much for coming here. My question to you is, why do you always wear red or maroon and also your favorite check shirt? <laughs> So, I had a um, long story, I, I, I did write a book, by the way, and most of these stories are in it if you want to read them. It's called Chants of a Lifetime, so somewhere you can get it. I think it's an e-book now. And this story is in there in detail, so I won't tell you the whole thing, but I had a nervous, a full-on nervous breakdown in the temple, right in front of Maharaji, in fact, in his lap, basically. I was just... I completely fell apart, and it had to do with a, a girlfriend of mine who had uh, committed suicide back in America. And um, so, uh, so I was very upset about this, and uh, he used to tease me. He started teasing me and saying, uh, "Your wife died, but you'll be happy when you get married again." And I said. All right, I don't want to marry you. <laughs> and he went, ha, 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 ha. if you marry me, you won't get, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it just, it's India, I couldn't get married. So uh, he started teasing me all the time about getting married. And I, I had, what used to happen, you see, there was maybe 30, 40 Westerners hanging out with them at any one time. Never more than that, it was very small. And you know, people would kind of get to know each other and then we'd go back to the hotel at night and everyone would get to know each other better. <laughs> they'd come back the next day and he'd look at them and say, oh, you're friends. <laughs> and they would think, ah, oh, yeah, we are, aren't we? And the next day they'd come back, oh, you're good friends. <laughs> and the next day they'd come back, you're married, go back to America. <laughs> go see your parents. Well, that was not happening. Because when I left America, I was never going back. I got rid of everything I had. I sold 
I gave my records away. You don't even remember records. It's, it's things with music on them. You remember records, yeah. So uh, I sold my guitar, my car, my, I gave my jeans away. Everything was gone. I was never coming back to America. So I would see that these people would kind of like, you know, and then they would have to go home. Uh-uh. So I was like, I didn't even, you know, I was completely paranoid and uptight. And uh, so he started teasing me, and I was determined to stay celibate while I was in India. And since that was going to be it, that was it. And he would just look at me and laugh, actually. So he started teasing me. He said, oh, he would say, you'll be happy when you're married. And I just, I started to kind of like this. And this whole thing happened with, with my previous girlfriend and everything, and I was very shaky. And then, um, anyway, I wind up completely falling apart. And uh, so he kind of put me back together. He hit me on the head, and he said a bunch of things to me. He was very kind to me, and uh, I kind of calmed down. And over the period of a few days, I was pretty much back to my usual abnormal state. And then, uh, so one day he looked at me. Oh, so one day, I, I, you know, all the West, a lot of the Westerns were smoking ganja and charas, you know, but I never really did. And one day I was out in the jungle after this nervous break, and I thought, maybe I should smoke a little charas. Totally reasonable thing to say to myself, right? <laughs> so I smoked a little charas, and I completely freaked out, and I ran through the jungle back into the temple, and I was running towards his room, and his, as I was approaching his room, the window opened up, and he looked out at me, and I, I, I just came through, and he said, you're Hanuman, you're Bajrang Bali. And, I, and, he said, and he said, what's your name? I said, Krishna Das, because he had given me that name. And he said, Nay, you're Bajrang Bali. What's your name? Krishna Das. <laughs> Nay, Bajrang Bali, Krishna Das. <laughs> and I said, okay. I said, so I'm talking to my guru, right? I said, okay, you want me to be Krishna Das? I mean, you want me to be Bajrang Bali? No problem. But you just remember, Bajrang Bali was eternally celibate. <laughs> He laughed so hard, he, I, I thought he was going to fall off the tuck of me. And he looked at me, okay, wise guy, you are Janaka. You'll have yog and bhog. Right? That's better, right? I'll take it. Then he said, you wear red. But he, he kept calling me Bajanga. He said, you wear red. Huh? He had me dye everything red. My lung goat, he had me. Yes, I left my Calvin clients back in America. <laughs> so that's where it starts. So I always wore red after that. And then uh, that's it. That's the whole story. But it was part of him kind of giving me an identity, giving me, you know, helping me feel good about myself again after this big breakdown. It was really pretty intense. So that's the story. Can you hear? Some buzz or something. Okay. Hello. Hi. Yeah. So uh, basically, um, I'm very de delighted to see you in India, and uh, I think uh, you are one of the luckiest persons to be associated with uh, Maharaji. So. Uh, Actually, I get very sad when I re read about the World War II, etc., which is a history, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, de uh, deaths of uh, six million Jews and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I really uh, wonder why such things happen in the world. Why uh, is it related to karma theory, as has been uh, told by many saints? Uh, uh, what Maharaji used to uh, explain this kind of uh, phenomenon, you know? So, Maharaji didn't explain these phenomena. For instance, one day uh, someone came from a nearby ashram and Maharaji said, why'd you come? 
He said, at your place, there's budget and kirtan and everything. Why'd you come? He said, oh, I just came to see what goes, goes on here. He said, oh, here? It's just al cow jow. <laughs> Really? He said that. This is the way he was. He didn't talk about that stuff, you know. I mean, not that he didn't know, but he didn't talk about it. Um, all I would say is that if you look, if we look inside ourselves, we'll see all the horror that we see outside in the world as well. Everything's inside of us. The anger, fear, the greed, the guilt, the shame, the selfishness, right? It's right in each one of us. So it's not surprising that horrible things happen out there because we're doing it to ourselves as well. And we're the ones doing it. Those are people just like us. I went to Auschwitz with a friend of mine who's a Zen master. And we spent a week all day in the camps where all these millions and millions of people were killed. And we did prayers and ceremonies and, you know, and what, the first couple of days were really hard. And I would look up in the sky and it was in the fall and the grass was green and the, the trees were all golden leaves and orange and yellow and red leaves. So beautiful. And then the, our guide said, you see all those trees and the green grass? He said, in those days there was nothing because the people ate everything that they could. They ate the leaves off the, the bark off the trees, the grass off the ground, there's nothing but mud. And I would look up at the sun and I would say, how can you dare to shine on this place? How? But every day the sun comes up and shines on that place. How could it be? I couldn't, you know, I was furious with the sun. But every day the sun came up. And then I realized, oh, that's the nature of the sun. To shine on the good and the bad, the high, the low. This is what real love is. And if we want to help the world free itself of all that negative stuff, we have to become like the sun. We have to develop unconditional love. And when we do that, there won't be any problems. But that's our work. And the other thing that happened is, you know, they told us a lot of stories about the guards in these camps, you know. And we would, I would start to think, how could people be like that? And then I thought, now wait a minute. What if I was born? in Nazi Germany to a family of Nazis. Would I know anything different? Would I be any different? I'd just be Nazi like that. I would do the same thing these people would have done. If there was nobody who could tell me that I'd be any different. Right? So you start to have some compassion because people will have to, to reap the fruits of their actions. So these very people who were the victimizers, will suffer terribly. And then it just goes back and forth, back and forth. So one must find a way to overcome our judgmental minds. And the only way to do that is a spiritual practice. And in these times, the repetition of the name is the most powerful practice to do. Uh, one more thing is that uh, I heard the Hanuman Chalisa uh, sung by your team, you, yourself and your team, and uh, I found it extremely devotional. I have uh, heard Hanuman Chalisa being sung, sung by other people, but somehow yeah. I got addicted to your uh, singing, uh, which made me very uh, quiet, you know, it quieted my mind. And it must be a grace coming through you from your Guru. So I have uh, tremendous respect towards your Guru. We'll see. And my Guru also is the uh, same. He, he died in 1913. Achha. His name was Gondavlekar Maharaj. Achha. 
he insisted on uh, chanting name of Rama Achha. throughout, uh, whenever you get time, I mean, whenever you remember. Awesome. And everything, you will get answers to all your questions by doing that. You don't stop that. You continue doing that. Yes. Don't get frustrated on your path. I won't That's stop. What, <laughs> and you will get answers to everything and you will ultimately get liberated. May not be in this life, but in future lives. And we have to believe that and start working on that. That's, that's the message I got from your guru as well. Sir, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Come next time to talk to me directly. <laughs> We learned the Hanuman, you know, we would go to the temple every day and they would give us this little booklet with this yellow booklet with this flying monkey on it, right? I had a hundred of those booklets. And then one day I said, what is this thing? I mean, you got to understand, we came from New York. Flying monkeys aren't big in New York. So I was like, what is this? They said, oh, it's a prayer to Hanuman. I said, ah. Now people would say that Maharaji Neem Karoli Baba was an incarnation of Hanuman and he was, they worshipped, people worshipped him that way as Hanumanji. So I thought, we could learn this prayer, right? And then we'll sing it to him and he'll like it and then he'll, because we knew that he secretly wanted to spend more time with the Westerners. <laughs> But he couldn't find a good excuse. So we wanted to give him a good excuse to spend more time with us. Right? So we learned, I couldn't even read Hindi at the time. I had to learn each letter. And we went through the thing, the Chalisa, letter by letter. You know, Jaya, like this. And it took us like two months. And we finally got it together and we learned it. And, uh, and it worked. He would call us all the time to sing it to him. And that's why, how, why we learned the Hanuman Shri said, and I'm still singing. So, somebody's back there. Hi. Guru would have... I'm sorry. Oh? Hello? Hello? Maybe stand up, uh, maybe it's not picking up the... Uh, yeah. Just pretend you're, in, pretend you're in public school now. <laughs> As a Guru, Maharajji would have imparted so many lessons to you. As a disciple, he would have imparted various lessons yeah. about life it, well, to you yeah. through various things, maybe yes. through his actions, through his words. Yeah. Today, if he wanted all of us to take something back through you, what would be that one single important lesson of life that you would want us to know? A secret recipe or a secret ingredient of life. <laughs> Don't ask for too much. <laughs> this is the only opportunity I'm going to get. Uh -uh. <laughs> anyway. Huh? Oh, you might get another opportunity next life. <laughs> uh, I, really, I gave it to you already. Ram Nam Karnese Sapurdha. This is, he said this over and over and over again and over and over and over. That's what he said. He said, from repeating the names of God, from repeating these names, everything is brought to fullness and completion. What you need in your life comes to you. What you don't need will leave your life. Everything you need will come to you through these practices because you get in touch with what's really important. And you get a different perspective on life through these practices, a real perspective. Not a dream like or intellectual understanding. It, it brings you into contact with your true self, with the God that lives within you. So that's the thing. Practice, you must do something. If you don't do something, you don't do something. It just stays the way it is. Unconscious flow of reactions day after day. And you never get a vote on it how things can be. Through these practices you get a vote about how you feel and you work with, you can you find a way to, to overcome adversity that you couldn't imagine. You could do that. It gets you, everything comes from that. Yeah. 
I used to say, Jow is my mantra. <laughs> he didn't need you to be around. You know, he, he... <coughs> Funny thing happened. So I met, when I first met Ramdas was Richard Alpert had come to America. Most of you know, come to India. And then he came back to America and I met him. And at that moment, that's when I met Maharaj. And I just felt something that I had never felt before. And of course it turned out that it was Maharaj. So uh, while I was still in America, I had this dream before going to India that I, I went to the, the, the elementary school that I went to as a kid. And I walked into the gymnasium of my elementary school. And in the middle of the room, oh, at the other end of the room, there was a, like a stage. And on the stage, there was a tucket. And there was, Maharaji was sitting on this tucket. And I had seen some little black and white pictures of him, so I knew it was him. But this was in, you know, color and the dream. And so I walked into the, into the middle of the room and I did Dunda Pranam. And I'm just, I had my head down, and I was just saying, please, I have to feel something. Please, let me feel something. I was going really powerfully, I was praying to feel something. And he, got, he gets up, and he walks down the steps at the end of the stage, and he walks over to me, and he puts his hand on the back of my head. And slowly I calm down, I calm down, and calm down, and then this bliss, started to run through my body, right? And it got stronger and stronger and stronger. And I thought, I'm going to die. <laughs> and just at that moment, he took his hand off my head. And he went back and sat down. And I woke up. And I woke up in bliss. It was extraordinary. So I never forgot this dream. About two years later, here I am in India. We're up in the mountains at the temple in Kenchi. And for some reason that day, I came to the I came late to the temple. Now, we, what used to happen is that we would get called into the room where he was sitting, you know? And so he would always be there. We ne I never saw him, I didn't realize it, but I never saw him walking before. So on this day, I walked into the courtyard and he's walking across the courtyard all by himself. And I just stopped and I, my mind just, stopped and I stopped and I just was like <coughs> and he stopped and he looked at me and he goes oh, these are crazy and, he, and the next thing I knew I'm right in front of him and he, I didn't even I was holding some apples I didn't even offer them to him I'm just like <coughs> and he grabs the apples and he starts throwing them around right this what stopped my mind was that the way he walked he had a very unusual walk like a baby but it was the way he walked in my dream two years before and I had never seen him walking until that moment and he walked just the way he walked in my dream before I ever came to India and he knew of course what was going on that's why he just laughed when basically whenever he looked at the West he just went like this <laughs> He couldn't believe. All we wanted to do was stare at him. I mean, we didn't want to move, we didn't want to eat, we didn't want to go, we just went. <laughs> and actually, he used to, and of course the Indian people would be coming and he would ignore them. And we would sit around him so that the Indian devotees couldn't get to him, you know? We made like a circle around him. <laughs> Not on purpose, we just didn't know. And then they would be, Baba, Baba, and he'd be just talking to us and laughing. I <laughs> never pay attention. <laughs> and he said, he said, you missed, no, I'm not going to say, he had the dirtiest mouth <laughs> in the three worlds. <laughs> I've purposely forgotten most of his curse words <laughs> because I started using them and people go. <laughs> yeah, so so I, I've had to forget them, but a few of them I remember. <laughs> but uh, he'd say to the Indian people, you people come here and you don't bring me, look at these people, they don't want anything. They, you ask for all this stuff, all they want to do, all they want is God. And I, would, we, I remember thinking, what's he talking about? <laughs> 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 but now, you know, 30 years later, 40 years later, I think, you know, he might have been right. 
We didn't want anything from him. We just wanted to stare at him. We just wanted to be there. It was so extraordinary. All the beauty in the universe was wrapped up in that blanket. And he would just look at us and laugh. And the way he taught, you know, you'd be sitting there and somebody would bring like mangoes or apples or bananas and he'd just be throwing them like this to everybody, right? And you're right in front and like, you don't get any. <laughs> it's okay for like a day. And then two days go by and you don't get any. Three days. And now you really you need Valium, you know, to get out of bed. What's going on? What am I doing? You're sitting right in front of him. It's like he's not even there. You're just like, what's wrong with me? I can't get it. <laughs> And then somebody calls your name, you turn, boom, you get hit in the heart with a banana. <laughs> and you look at him and you go, oh. <laughs> This is, you know, we, he would bring us into this love, and then our minds would take us out of it. Just like that, over and over and over again. It's amazing. And you'd be sitting right in front of him, living in hell, right? Just like that. And then he'd hit you with a banana and everything was okay. <laughs> it's just that you could be so stupid. I mean, you know, so vulnerable and so open. It was, it was amazing. But it, day after day, it was like that. Without him, I didn't know that there was love in the world. I don't know. It's different in, in, in the West. Families are different there. It's not the same kind of love in the families. It really isn't. It's different. As soon as kids can get out of the house, they're gone. They're gone. Uh, one of his great devotees, I think Dada, came to uh, visit us in America. We were driving him around, showing him the neighborhoods, his big houses, right? He said, where are the people? And we said, well, Dada, you know, the, the kids are away. Where are they? Well, they moved away. So who's living there? Well, the parents might be. What, what if one of them dies? Well, they kind of live alone. They, in this huge house, like, be like, there'd be like five generations of Indians living in this house. <laughs> And there's one old guy sitting watching TV, eating, eating TV dinners. And he's all alone and lonely, and the kids are never call. It's different in America, it really is. It's, and it's not that parents don't love their children. It's just, I don't know, they're brought up differently. It's a different world. Like I said, I was kind of, I kind of was forced the Tuari family to adopt me. And I would come and I'd arrive, and I'd just be living on the living room couch with all my stuff, you know. And life would be going on and everything, you know. And <clears throat> they would yell at each other in my house. Don't look at me like that. Don't, don't raise your voice to me. This is, you know, and these people were yelling at each other, you know, screaming and yelling and having a great, you know, just like, and I, for a while it, I, I couldn't understand, but then I realized no one in that family was afraid that the other person would really throw them out of their hearts. It's not even possible. Where I grew up, you're already out of it. You grow up feeling unaccepted and unloved. It's a whole other ballgame. And one of the greatest things for me when I came here was to hang out and, and be close with these families. And Mr. Tuari was, oh, he was a piece of work. He used to love to fight. He would do things to me. And then he'd go, you will fight upon me now? He wanted to fight. He wanted to party. And he would piss me off. He would do things. And he was like, yeah, let's go, you know? <laughs> and we'd be like nose to nose, eye to eye, and I'm screaming at him and yelling. He's, he's going, yeah, yeah. And we're looking at each other, and I couldn't believe it. We could do this? <laughs> wow. It was so liberating. Yeah. 
It's a shame. It's really a shame the way things are. Western culture is totally screwed. And guess what? The Indians are getting that disease too. <laughs> to do. You see gangbangers walking around Delhi and Mumbai with their pants down at your left. <laughs> what are you doing? <clears throat> when I first got to the hills, they didn't even have telephones. Now you got cell phones that pick up and call, you know, California. What's playing at the movies today? It's crazy. It's crazy. That's just what's happening. So, but you know, you have to. It, it's all part of a process, you know. That when I people started interviewing me, I mean, can you imagine? I couldn't imagine it. They would say, "What about all these rock stars who are doing yoga and stuff like that? Isn't that just like, you know, bullshit?" And I said, no, you don't understand. These are the kings of the world. The kings and queens of the world. They can have everything and anything they want, anytime, 24 hours a day. And they know, they've experienced it personally, that no matter how much stuff they get, it doesn't make them happy. This is, this is the big teaching. And this is just what Buddha was talking about when he came out of the jungle and he said, oh monks, stuff don't work. You don't get happiness from external things. And it's the people who not only have the access, but have the karmic possibility of learning from that situation. Because there's plenty of people who have access to just as stupid as they always were, and never look inside. And there are other people who recognize that, wait a minute, this is not really working, even though it looks like it is, right? When I, uh, you know, I met some of these big stars, and so Madonna, I was with Madonna, and I said, she said she wanted to go to India, and I said, oh yeah, cool, are you gonna go by yourself? She with me, by myself? I can't go to the grocery store by myself. And I thought, oh wow. I don't think she bargained for that, you know? Prisoner, she's a prisoner. Yeah, she's got all this stuff and flies around, but she's a prisoner, she can't do anything. That's crazy, huh? So she got one thing, but she lost another thing. Yeah, somebody, where's the, I don't know where the mic is. I'm not the boss. You asked already, you had your opportunity. They can. It's okay, you're close enough to understand. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to see you here. So closely. And I like your song so much. And uh, my guru, Prasad, he invites you and you came here. Yeah. Uh, I thank you to Prasad Guru. Yes. And uh, he played your songs so many times. And I um, spiritually did sing, and I like it very much, very much. And your voice is so nice, so in, in your voice there is very much depth. Your voice is God's gift. And you sing the songs by your heart, with, with uh, devotion, with uh, expression, uh, by own your... Um, and uh, when you sing in the on the earth, your voice goes to the heaven. And God and goddesses came to the earth to see you and to bless you and bless us also, because uh, you you invite them. They like your voice and your voice is. Nad Brahma, like Nad Brahma. It's, yeah, it's very strong. And I, I, I love that. And uh, I thank you very much.
Okay, you can stay, but every day I want you to sit down in front of Hanumanji's temple and sing Sitana, just Sitana. Okay? Not bad rent to pay. <laughs> so the next day we arrived in the temple and they were already out there singing Sitana, right? There were these two old guys right now. They didn't have any instruments or anything. One guy would go, Sitaram, 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 Sitaram. And the other guy would go, Sitaram, 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 Sitaram. Back and forth, back and forth. So that morning it was a pretty long wait for Maharaji, and these guys were out there, and they must have got bored or something, right? So one guy goes, Sitaram, 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 De Lakshama. <laughs> The other guy goes, oh, jazz. <laughs> so he goes, Sitaram, Sitaram, Lakshman, Jehanuman. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they were going like, Ram, Lakshman, Jan, Kijay, Bolo, Hanuman. So Maharaji was in his room, you know. The walls are this thick, and he's, the room is in a room, behind a room. We heard, Sitaram. <laughs> I never forgot that long lecture on Let him stop me now. <laughs> so the, the funny story about these guys, right? So they wound up spending some time in the temple. And one day there was some, a, a few weeks later, there was uh, some kind of celebration. And everybody's out in front of the Murtis singing and dancing and shaking things and stuff. And these guys had nothing to shake, right? Nothing to bang on. So they ran into the kitchen. And they got some pots and pans out of the kitchen and they brought them into the temple and they're banging on them, right? This, no, no. Maharaji sees it and goes, ah! Get out, get out, get out, get out. So they, they, had, they put the pots and pans in and they got their stuff and left the temple, right? <clears throat> the minute they were gone, he went, <laughs> And he started singing this thing, like, I don't, like, over and over and over and over and over and over. He kept singing this like, and I'm looking at this Indian guy next to me and I said, what is he singing? He just goes. What is he singing? What is he singing? You know that look. Finally, he tells me, he's singing, You banged the gong and I threw you out. You banged the gong and I threw you out. This is the way of the siddhas and saints. I never forgot that. You banged the gong. Okay, so there were some questions before. Somebody had some hands up. Hopefully, uh, I thought we could have obliterated your mind by now. Um, Krishna Maharaji, I am not... Oh, it's okay. You, you need to stand up, please. 
It's a little bit, it's got to catch the signal from there. Hello? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm not going to compete with Auntie there and tell you how beautiful it is to have you here. She just did it so beautifully. She won. Um, <laughs> Nobody can do that. It's finished. Okay. What? Um, but I just wanted to say, um, so I, I organize a music festival and fortunately or unfortunately we have trance as a genre and it's beautiful to have that on the electronic stage but this is just so fantastic and it's good to have you here and it's, it's nice because we need to do more of this. It's, it's so feel good, and I, and I just wanted to understand when I chant. I don't necessarily understand the meaning of the mantras or what I'm chanting. Do you know I? I, yeah, that's what I want to know. Do you? And, and how important is it? The real meaning of, of these names are, is beyond the intellect. It's beyond anything we can understand with our minds or emotions. Keep letting go of whatever you're thinking, experiencing, and, and center on the name. And you eventually you come home, and it's a it's a deep deepest feeling you could ever have, and it keep, keeps going deeper. Just let go of what you. But these names don't mean anything up here. I mean, there are, of course there's stories uh, and and all the scriptures. Those that's good, but that's not the real meaning of the name. The real meaning of the name is is you know, the whole thing, the whole universe, and that's something you can understand intellectually or emotionally. You can cry, you can do whatever, but you're still there and the name is still going on so you can let go. When you reach the place that there's no letting go, when there's no one to let go, all that you will be is your own being, your true self shining. So just forget trying to understand this stuff. But, uh, now, let me also say that you asked me the question and I answered it. If you ask somebody else, there are many different ways of approaching these practices and many different uh, teachings out there, and they all work for those people who do them. So this is just the way I do it. And unfortunately, you came here, so <laughs> you're getting it. You know? But there's many different ways of approaching the practice and many different lineages, and they all, they're all good. Maharaji made us find our own way into things. He didn't make it easy. When I was leaving India, he was finally sending me back to America. I said, I'm just learning Hindi. He said, too bad. So I was sitting in front of him. And I, I had been walking around India in a red dress and barefoot for two years. What am I going to do in New York? I do not think the red dress is going to make it there. <laughs> you know, like a red elephant, you know, that's it. And I was freaked. What am I going to do in America? What am I going to do? So I said, i got to ask him. And then the other voice said, shut up. You should have faith. Don't you dare ask. What's wrong with you? You have no faith. You're miserable. I don't know what I'm going to do. What am I going to do? <laughs> Finally, I blurted out, Baba, how can I serve you in America? He made a face like he just bit a pickle. <laughs> I mean, how can I? I'm not worried about how to serve him. I want him to tell me what to do. I'm not thinking about serving him. And he knew it. So he said, I saw Kicho Vaisakaro. Do what you want. Now, I have been celibate for three years. <laughs> what? You know what I want to do. And of course he did. So I couldn't, figure, how is that going to be serving you? <laughs> And then he looked at me and said, ha, ha, ha. So, how do you serve me? <laughs> and I, my mind just, I, I completely went blank, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> so it was time for me to go. And I walked across the courtyard and I pronounced to him for the last time. And uh, as I was pronouncing, I heard a voice in my head, my own voice, right? 
but it wasn't me talking. I don't know how to explain it. And it said, I'll sing to you in America. Right? Okay, that sounds cool. I can do that. But, you know, it took me 21 years to start singing with people. To start singing to him. 21 years. Now, if he had told me, go back and sing, I would have started singing, but it wouldn't have been any good. There was all this built up stuff in me. All these desires, all this darkness, all this stuff that I had to live through in order to get to the place that I could really sing to. And it took me all that time. But now, when I do it, I'm doing it. Because I actually want to do this. If you had asked me, would I ever in my life be able to do what I wanted to do, I would have said, no way. Not that I even knew what that was. This is what I want to do. Isn't that crazy? That's grace. And this is, this is what I want. I'd rather be doing this than almost anything. <laughs> so the idea, the thing is that he never told us what to do with our lives. He, we had to find what was right for us individually. He didn't make it easy. But the result is that when we do find that, that's it. There's no, there's no doubt about it. We, it's, it's just, we know it's right. And all the devotees had to go through this, you know, all his disciples had to go through this in their own way. In their own ways. There's no substitute for your own experience and for your own search to find out what's right for you. And that includes taking into account everything in your life. You just don't walk off to the jungle because you bring all your stuff with you. And you know what? There's no TV. <laughs> Where would you want to go? <clears throat> Anybody else? You're the boss up. You have the trilogy. Hi. My mother would not be here today, but she specifically asked me to ask you this question. Uh, I think you have to stand up. You're breaking up. Maybe the battery is gone. Who knows? I was saying my mother would not be here today, but she so, wanted to ask this question to you. Um, why are good things happening for bad people all around us, and good people are suffering? And you know, it doesn't make any sense, uh, but it's happening all the time. I don't know. <laughs> I just know this, Vi Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram, as much as I can. That's the only thing I know. Everything else is a mystery. And I've actually stopped asking those questions because I don't find them useful. Uh, who can understand anything? When you're sick, you take medicine. How does it work? You don't ask first, you take the medicine. Unless I understand how penicillin works, I don't care, I'm going to die. No. That's not what you say. Some things you just can't understand. Even the things you can, you might be able to understand, it's not even useful to try sometimes. These are the big questions nobody knows, you know. What is it, you know, the creation hymn in the Rig Veda. In the Rig Veda, you know, book number one, the beginning of everything. In the beginning, this was like this and this and this and this happened and this happened. Why did all this happen? Only he in highest heaven knows. Or perhaps he knows not. It actually says that. So tell your mother, give it up. 
have some chai, relax, take it easy. <laughs> Get over it. You know, because uh, there's no way to understand these things on this plane. You know, the great saints understand why things happen. They can see the karmas of people and how they work and stuff like that. But we can't. We don't even know who we are. How can we understand that kind of stuff? Let's find out what we, let's deal with what we have to deal with, which is our own bullshit, right? And our own beauty. And then worry about that other stuff when we figure that out. Maybe don't use the word bullshit when you're talking about it. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's people over here. I would like to uh, convey my heartfelt gratitude to you, sir, because uh, Prasad, sir, actually taught me how to love. I didn't know how to love. My heart was completely blocked. And uh, since last year, after watching your documentary, and after seeing you live in the concert, um, I was inspired to make a trip to Kenji with my friend. And uh, I think the only question I kept asking God was, uh, there's a lot of love I feel in my heart and what to do with it. And since then, I think I was given this lovely picture of Babaji with his blessing that was uh, one of his disciples who said, uh, do whatever you can with all your heart. Uh, since then, I have, uh, I have Babaji in my altar and uh, I, uh, I listen to your music and I chant in the morning. The only problem I'm facing right now is that in the morning when I wake up, I'm in this sattvic state and you know, I'm, I'm in good state. By the end of the day, I start reacting, you know. And the, how do I bring it to practice every moment? Uh, the whole practice of chanting. They call it practice. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna just keep going, that's all. And don't judge yourself, you, you know, all, this is also thoughts. You're judging yourself, you're evaluating. The evaluating mind is very busy. Oh, I'm not doing this right, I'm not doing this right. You're sure you're on day now, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't care, there wouldn't be anybody in the whole universe that cared about what you're not doing and what you are doing, right? Yeah. So it's just, your, just, that's your stuff. It gets added to my karma, no? Nah. <laughs> Who knows? Every time you, you make a move towards towards that inner place, it creates, it plants seeds. It plants <coughs> seeds that keep growing and bring you back again and again. Just, you know, just do your practice, live your life, and do the best you can. Try not to judge yourself, because you don't know who you are. Why would you judge yourself? You might be even better than that. You know, you, you're telling yourself some story that you believe in. That's insanity. That's actually the def definition of insanity. Believing what you think. <laughs> Why would you do that? It's just, where did the thought come from? Where did it go? You don't know. Let it go. Who cares? Ram, ram. You just keep going deeper. Just keep going. Just... You always, you, and every time you think of the mantra, or the name, through the day, just, you know, just pay a little attention until you forget again, and then you remember. It's a constant process of coming away, going away, and coming back, over and over and over, and it's a long, it takes time, and dedication, and just remember, look, that's all. That's, that's the big thing, remember. What happens after that, it's just stuff. Uh, just remember the name. And then you're thinking again. Oh, you remember again. In and out, in and out, all the time. Don't try too hard because if you try too hard, you just shoot off in, the wrong, in another direction. You, know? you just kick yourself out of your own house. Yeah, just uh, you did that. Where are you living? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm yeah. Yeah. You got it right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Somebody else. Um, hello, and Hi. welcome to India. Thank you. And it's wonderful to meet you. After seeing your documentary, One Track Heart, 
there is a bit where after Maharaji lost, uh, left his body, you went through a low period and you were told that you have yet to see his universal form. I have yet, you have yet to see his universal form or his big form. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so could you please share that experience? <laughs> All I can say is my editor should have been a bit a little stronger. <laughs> I was very attached to Maharaji, physically, emotionally, very attached to him. And uh, <clears throat> He wasn't attached to me because he's God and he knows that he's me and everybody's everybody. So it's no problem for him to go away because he didn't go anywhere. But I suffered terribly for a long time. I'd run around the jungles, like, you know, and I'd go up to these babas and I'd say, I'm looking for my guru. And they'd look at me like I was crazy. And they'd say, your guru? He's looking out of your eyes right now kind of thing they would say. And I would just say, ah, they don't know. And I'd run away. <clears throat> so this attachment to his body was going to really destroy me. It, 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 I couldn't be happy. I couldn't be at peace. And uh, I just wasn't going to make it. You know? And it was just emotional stuff. It wasn't spiritual, so to speak. But it's my stuff, right? And everybody has to punch their way out of their own paper bag. You know, we have to get make our way through our own stuff. This was this was my stuff. And it wasn't I wasn't seeing his divinity when I was attached to him. I was seeing that I lost something on the physical plane emotional feelings, right? It was just all human stuff. But, and it was killing me. So, uh, by the grace of the Guru, uh, uh, and he opened me up, you know, he, he, he just pulled back the curtains on the, on the universe and showed me the way things are. And uh, this is what he was called his big form. It's like Krishna in the Gita, you know, when Arjun sees, and he's, it saves him. So maybe on a minuscule little level, it was something like that. And, uh, I, I saw through my own stuff. I saw through all of this. I saw it clearly the way things are. And uh, it was fantastic. And that experience stayed with me for almost nine months. It kind of started, it, it faded. And one day I woke up and it was a memory. But that was, took about nine months. I was like still in, you know, and now it's a memory, a good memory. <coughs> and it affects everything about me. See, what happened was uh, I had started singing with people back in the States in 94. And after a few months, uh, I could see what was going to happen. This. Hi. <coughs> And I could see that I was hungry. And a hungry person will feed themselves with whatever comes to them. And that I would misuse all of this to feed my own hungry desires. And I saw that I could not, that that's what was going to happen. I, there was nothing else I was capable of doing other than that, of misusing this whole situation 
to feed my own stuff. And I was, I was horrified because that's not why I was doing this. I was doing this to save my life. And I was, I was being prevented now from doing it by my own stuff. It was horrible. The feeling was unbelievably horrible. The despair was so total. I saw no way out. There was no way, nothing I could do. Right? So I went to India and I started talking to Maharaji. And I said, you have to fix this. This is your problem. I'm singing to people in your name. You have to fix this. This is your problem. Now fix it. Nothing. Nothing happened. Day after day. I would wake up. You haven't done anything. What's up with you? Right? And day after day, it went on and on and on. Every day I woke up. And I was the same asshole I was when I went to sleep the night before. And I couldn't do anything about it. So, uh, on June 15th, there's a, a Bandara at Kenshi, up in the temple. And it's the day that the Hanuman Temple was opened. And <clears throat> every June 15th, under June. And uh, I had never gone to one of those Bandaras because back in 1972, I was living in the temple with Maharaji. And the I was sick. I was recovering from hepatitis at the time. And I got sick the, a couple of days before the Bandar, and he sent me to the Bandar. So, out of stubbornness, I would never go to one of those Bandaras on June 15th. Even if I was staying in the temple, I would leave the temple for three days, and I'd come back after the Bandar. That's how crazy I am. So, one of his devotees, his great, one of his greatest devotees, Sidney Ma, was there. And she looked at me and she said, so what are your plans? This is in early May. And I said, well, I've got to go back to New York in a couple of weeks. And she said, no, no, no. You have to stay here until 100 June. You have to see Maharaji's big form. I thought, what is she talking about? So I made some calls back to New York. Nobody was looking for me. So the next day, <laughs> the FBI happened to be on vacation. <laughs> so I said, uh, I said, okay, I can stay. So everything happened on that day. So the night before, every day I would go to this, you know, when I lived in the temple, there was no lights. There was almost no electricity in the whole valley. And now there's lights everywhere, houses everywhere. But there's one place in the back of the temple where if you go and you stand kind of like this, you're out of all the light and you can see the sky. So I would go back to the spot and I would talk to Maharaji every night while I was in the temple. And I said, Baba, you know, what are you doing? You've got to fix this. I'm not singing until this is fixed. I can't do it. You know that. Now do something. Good night. I wake up the next day and it was the same. So, the night before the Bandara, I go out there, and this is it, because I'm leaving the day after the Bandara. I go out there and I say, what is going on, you know? Why haven't you fixed this? You can do this, it's no problem for you, you've you got to fix this. And then I just said, well, what can I do? If you're not going to fix it, you're not going to fix it. All right, I'll go back, how bad can it be? Good night. That turned out to be the moment of surrender. That's the moment that I accepted, right? I wasn't, I gave up demanding him to change everything. And I accepted it the way it is. I said, all right, I'll go back, I'll sing. How bad can it be? <laughs> on the next day, everything changed. As the day wore on with people coming to the temple and everybody getting fed, you know, 20, 70,000 people took meals that day. The roads were closed for 20 miles in either direction. There were lines of people coming in, eating, going home. So one, at one point I was standing there uh, kind of uh, on these steps looking down to the temple and I saw all 
all these people like you know, lined up, right? Coming into the temple, waiting, coming up on the roof, getting fed, then leaving by this other bridge. And I saw, you know, all every single one of these people woke up in the morning and they said, hey, let's go to that bandar. You know, we'll get that bus and then we'll catch that train. And then if we hurry, we can get the train back and just like that. I saw that's what they thought. But actually, Maharaji was dragging them there, throwing food in their mouth and dragging them off. But he was doing everything without doing anything. Here's where we get a little out there, okay, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> I cannot explain to you how this works. All I can do is tell you my experience, and then you can go home and never come back again. <laughs> but I had the iron, I saw that these people thought they were doing it. Just like I think I'm doing this, and you think you're listening. But he, he was doing everything without doing anything. I don't know how, to, it all happened perfectly inside of him. And this kind of just started building in me, and deeper and deeper and deeper, until I saw or experienced what was kind of behind the scenes, so to speak. And Okay, so when I ex one of the things I experienced is I was looking up into the sky at one point, and I saw this little kind of thickening in the atmosphere. By the way, I was pretty happy. <laughs> I don't want to say bliss because you know that word is a little overused, but it was pretty cool. <laughs> and I was feeling so quiet. There were no thoughts going through this, whatever this is. There was nothing happening. And everywhere I turned, love was rushing towards me. People were coming up to say goodbye, and usually I go, like I'll do to you later, thank you. <laughs> but now I was just going like, I'll go, yeah. yeah uh. There was nobody to turn it off. I wasn't turning it off, pushing it away. It was just, so at one point I was kind of like, I looked up in the sky and I saw this little kind of thickening out there, right? And I just laughed and I said, oh, that's Krishna Dasness. <laughs> and I saw that even though, even when I think I am me, I'm not. I just think I am. Like, you often hear it listening, you hear it, and I think I'm talking. That's just one level. But I was experiencing something else, that there was nothing except this extraordinary, uh, vast presence. And when I thought I was Krishna Das, I really thought I was. And I acted like I am. But I wasn't. Even when I think I am, I'm not. There's just this presence, which we're not aware of most of the time. And so I got free to go back and sing. Because it had nothing to do with me. Nothing. It looks like it does. And you look like you and I look like me. Well, good luck, you know. So this was his way of lifting me out of this whole level of stuff that I think, that I feel, that I believe, and showing me that it's much deeper. And the other, and then, and the people coming, you aren't coming for me. You're coming for that, right? Yes. I mean, you might think it's me, and I might think it's me, but that's just our problem. It's that that you're coming for, and that's what we're getting. So it just freed me to really come back and really sink, and not have to worry about anything, and not hold back, not try to run the show. You think we have a plan? Ah! We just, who knows what we're doing? So that's it. And 
this was, for me, this was, I saw, this was all him. Everything happened inside of him, and he was totally, everything was perfect inside of him the way it should be. And I didn't have to know what anything other than just that, to give it my best shot and not hold back. And I was free to come back and start singing again. He did do it. And you know, the whole time, I never doubted that he could. Just because he's been dead 30 years, that didn't make any difference. I just didn't know if he would. Right? And he did. So. I was born again. And again. And again. Really, it was uh, the beginning of my life. So everything was before that, and everything after that. And I was... But like I said, I've lost touch with that. But it's still in me. It's, it's there. And I, it, it affects everything I do. So, I'm sorry, was that too out there? Oh. Okay. Well, shouldn't have put it in the book in the first place. <laughs> oh, that's a hand. Okay. Felt <laughs> that right over here. Jay Guru Jay So this is not a intellectual or an intelligent question. Okay. It's a very basic physical or a material level. Can I come and hug you, please? Uh, please. Uh, in front of all these people. <laughs> uh, talk to my manager over here. <laughs> we'll figure out a way to get a hug in, okay? Before the night's over. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Hi. Hi. Uh, since we're talking about a little closer, thanks. Uh, like how you are passionate about uh, singing, I'm passionate about walking. Walking? Yeah, I walk uh -huh. long distances. I walk to Tirupati from Bombay. What? Every time. Very nice. Each time. Uh, I wish I wish I was walking. I, mean, I might be able to walk again. Uh, I go to Nainital to Almora also walking. Really? I go to Dwarahat often. I go to Kanchi on the way to Dwarahat. Uh -huh. And uh, I go to the temple. I bow at uh, Pranam and everything. Mm -hmm. But I was really not into uh, reading about Maharaj. I just didn't want to go through the books and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to Haridwar. For the Kumbh Mela. After that, I went to Allahabad for the Kumbh Mela. And while I was walking in Allahabad, I keep going. Uh, I mean, I used to walk every day alone without my friends and all. And every day, I used to see a uh, six feet two tall, uh, well built gentleman with an aura which is indescribable. I just always felt like walking with him. I used to follow him, I used to disappear in the crowds. He always had a checkered blanket over his body, tall, and I go back to Dwarah, go to Kanchi, read the book, and there he is. That's him. Achha. He's photographed. Achha. Yes, this is the book. The last one. Why don't my legs work? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, is it possible that when you are like listening to a particular chant, you get just used to listening to that particular chant and what you feel during that chant, it is not necessary that you feel in the same, the same chant sung by you. You probably don't feel the same peace or the same, uh, uh, you know, I've cried listening to Baba Hanuman, but it has never happened with any other chant of yours. So how is that possible? So, Look, let's, maybe, is it I'm just a puppet. You know, you know who's pulling the strings. When I sing, you feel him because that's that's what it is. That we all feel that. That's why I sing, because when I sing, I feel him more and more deeply than when I'm watching TV. <laughs> so I sing as much as I can, and I try to remember him as deeply as I can, and that's what you feel. That's that's what I would say. 
And I'm not trying to sell you my guru. There's nowhere to go to get him. He's not, you can't find him these days. <laughs> He's a little bit hard to find. So, you know, I'm just saying this is what it is. And that's, that's all I can say. I don't know what anything else is, but I know what this is. And it's all by his grace that all this has happened. That's the way I feel. I mean, I'm the one talking, so I'm going to just tell you what I feel. It's, it's happening by his grace and his blessings. He never said to go forth and chant the name of people. He never said that. I had to find what brought him back to me. And this is what it does. And it happens to include y'all, all you people. Because it just works that way. I didn't plan this, but it's all his doing. So, you don't look happy with that. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> okay. How are we doing? Oh, okay, sir. Can you stand up? You have to stand up because it's not catching the. Uh, I, uh, I just want to talk to you, uh, when uh, Nanaji left his body, mm -hmm. and you said that 21 years that wilderness in a sense, any thought of giving up on uh, having faith in him or loving him because nothing was happening in those 21 years uh, in you? And was loving or trying to love him that time was more like a practice for you or it was a blind faith, what exactly was it? You mean after he left the body? What, what did I feel? Yeah. I felt horrible. I mean, I felt like my life I mean, was over. Um, for the 21 years, you, know, you, you never gave up your faith for him. So, where did that much of love, you know, in you for him? I mean, what is the origin of that? I never doubted him. I just doubted me. Okay? I never doubted him. I just doubted me. I didn't think that I would ever be able to find that kind of love again, anywhere. And I had terrible depression and terrible despair. And if you've read the books, you know I got into a lot of trouble because I, I didn't want to live. Because I, I had lost the only thing that made my life worth living. So, uh, But he, uh, he always said that, and he says, this is a quote, he said, once I take hold of your hand, I never let go, even if you let go of mine. He said that a lot. And uh, he never let go of me, even though I had let go of him. And here I am. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Uh, I just would like to know how do you connect your music uh, to go deep inside or to connect to your inner self or to your divinity? I sing and when I notice I'm not paying attention, I sing. That's all I do. Everything comes from that. I'm not aiming at some deep place inside of me. I'm not trying to achieve any particular state of mind. I'm simply paying attention and chanting the name. And when I know I'm, when I notice I'm not paying attention, I come back. That's all I do. A thousand times a minute, if necessary. That's all. Everything comes from being here, coming back again and again, and the name brings us back. It has magnetism. It has power. It has juice an attractive nature, it attracts our minds, but we're going so fast in the opposite direction that it takes some time to feel differently about it. That's why they call it practice. You gotta do it, but nothing happens. <laughs> so, it's on, I think. 
maybe stand up. I think it's, yeah, sorry. Uh, do you have any deep experiences while uh, going deep into chanting itself? No. <laughs> what kind of music do you listen to? Apart from chanting. What kind of music do I listen to apart from chanting? Uh, just the usual stuff. You know, just whatever's, you know, Ray Charles, Van Morrison, Bruce Springsteen, Beatles, Rolling Stones. I listen to anything. But I don't, you know, the funny thing is I don't listen to a lot of music. I listen to this one Tibetan Lama that chants that I know is fantastic. Uh, the Lama's chant, it's called. Um, do yo, this great stuff. <laughs> So, uh, you know, that's it. I'm just, you know. But when I'm alone, and I'd rather have quiet. I don't listen to a lot. You know, if I'm not chanting, I just keep quiet. Okay? Okay, so, okay, more questions? Because let's, we'll, let's sing a little bit before we go, huh? Yeah. This, Okay, hold on. Thank you. I heard this name Krishna Das from an American woman in New York State uh, in Walden. Uh, her name is Girija and she uh, I was expecting and my Gurudev told me to go and stay with her instead of staying in Ashram. Sure. So we went to in Shanti Mandar, if you know about it. So I went to her house and everybody was going to the temple, to the Ashram and because I was expecting eight months pregnant, so just thought, you know, taking some rest. So she took me in her outhouse and uh, it was a beautiful Hanuman temple. Mm. And then she said, we sat there and she talked about all experiences she had with Hanuman. She showed me beautiful, you know, murti. And then she said, okay, you should listen to this. And it was Hanuman Chalisa by you. And I was wondering, oh, who is this? So, best Hanuman Chalisa I have heard. And she said, it's by an American. I said, yeah, by an American. <laughs> And my eyes was like, oh, American singing Hanuman Chalisa, like, you know, and so good. The best Hanuman Chalisa I have ever heard. And since that day, we have been hooked to Krishna Das. Mm -hmm. And my son uh, was born, like, uh, you know, after <laughs> uh, I have a half month. And he's hooked to Krishna Das as well. Sure. And now he's totally into music. He plays piano and tabla and harmonium. And... Uh, he led, uh, uh, you know, to around 250 people's gathering in Brindavan chant. He led uh -huh. chant. So I just wanted you to bless him that whatever he's doing, he should do it the way you are doing with all your heart. What do you mean? It's competition. I'm not going to do Keep singing, keep singing, keep singing. <laughs> you know, this thing about being an American, don't get too carried away with that, okay? I remember very distinctly, I had this dream where, in the dream I was taking incarnation, right? And I was right on, on the way down to somewhere in India, and I made a wrong turn. I left the right in New York. You know? Just one miserable life, don't get carried away here. <laughs> Okay. We sing? Yes. So on behalf of everybody, I would like to thank you, Krishnadas. A big round of applause once again. <laughs>